in the uh, early 80s, there was a huge investment in IT around the country um, that uh, made it possible for many people to have access to computers on their desktop, access to internet and so forth. In the uh, early 80s also, we saw the beginnings of, uh, of uh, sequence databases and, and certain principles of open access and international data sharing uh, also started then. In 1988, uh, Congress established uh, NCBI, and uh, that was really at the beginning periods of the Human Genome Project. Uh, and, uh, and, and we've, so we've been involved kind of at the interface of, of the uh, molecular data and, uh, and the online literature for right from the beginning. In 97, uh, PubMed was launched by uh, Vice President Gore uh, as a free, uh, free access web-based bibliographic database. It really grew out of our, our understanding that if we were going to make the sequence data available, it was useful to have the associated abstracts from the papers also available, and then we realized it was useful to have papers that were similar on the similar subject available, and then after that we thought we might as well make it all freely available. As you probably know, Medline was available before that, but it wasn't free. And then in February 2000, uh, PubMed Central was launched. The earliest journals in there were the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Molecular Biology of the Cell. Um, and the idea behind this uh, archive was that if a publisher wanted to have their content archived, we would do it for free. We would keep it available. In general, they would give us content that was at least a few months or a year old, um, so it wouldn't impact on subscriptions. And um, uh, frankly, the people involved thought it was a good thing that the publishers, especially the society publishers, would buy into it, um, although um, we were wrong. Um, most of them really were very nervous about it. So the philosophy behind PubMed Central um, was, number one, it was quite consistent with the National Library of Medicine's general mandate uh, as a national library to acquire, organize, preserve, and disseminate the results of biomedical research, um, but to extend that to the electronic literature, which as you know, it's a real challenge for libraries now that uh, in the past when you had print, you could archive it in your library. Now much of the content is available electronically and you're only getting a subscription and the libraries can't actively play a role in archiving. Um, the idea would be in PubMed Central that you would have free and unrestricted access to the material and it would be uh, 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 integrated with all the other online information. Uh, and because the way we use the information would change over time, that it was very important to have it as an open archive so that you could keep curating and finding issues with how you've mapped the information into the digital format and the library had found actually from uh, Medline for many years that the best way to ensure that the electronic content was in a usable form was to actually keep using it in a lot of different ways. So that was an important aspect to it. So back in the beginning, the only way content would get into PubMed Central was that a publisher would voluntarily offer to, to, to participate. They would sign an agreement. The copyright would be retained by the publisher or the author, depending on how that content came in the beginning. NLM would have a non-exclusive perpetual use license for the content. Generally, there would be free access within 12 months of publication, although some of the journals actually had it available immediately. The journal could stop depositing, could get out of the agreement at any time, but the content that was already in would stay available. Now, while PubMed Central has been associated with open access movement, in fact, the true open access articles are only a fraction of the content in PubMed Central. Most of the content does have restrictions that are imposed by either the publisher or, or the other copyright holder. Currently, um, PubMed Central also is a repository for author manuscripts. That's the form of the paper which has gone through all peer review and had all the revisions due to peer review. Um, uh, and, and that is often what is, the, what is supposed to be deposited under various funding agency mandatory deposition. Uh, uh, policies. So NIH has one of these policies after a year. Wellcome Trust and other UK funders have it after six months. Howard Hughes, uh, six months. The Canadian Institutes of Health Research also have these policies. And now a growing number of private foundations have mandatory deposition rules, which is if you get money from us, then after some period of time, the content has to be freely available in PubMed Central. 
Well, this is something that we found true for PubMed Central and actually true for most of our databases, which is that as the content, as the, the database gets more comprehensive, the usage goes up approximately proportionally. And this is true for molecular databases, and it's also turning out to be true for PubMed Central, that the archive is more useful and therefore used more as it gets more comprehensive. And that, I think, was one of the motivations uh, for Dr. Zahuni and for Congress to get involved in making um, some aspects of the program no longer voluntary but uh, mandatory. December 26 of 2007, uh, Congress uh, made the uh, public access mandatory. Uh, essentially, if you got NIH funding, you had to make sure your paper was available in PubMed Central within a year of publication, or it was freely available within a year. It would be put in, submitted at the time of, uh, of acceptance. And in uh, 2009, this was uh, made a uh, uh, permanent policy. Uh, I would like to say that 100% of the papers are going in now. Uh, right now, we're at probably around 65% compliance rate. A number of steps are going to be taken over the next year that I think will move us up to closer to 100%. Uh, I think NIH has really tried to kind of take a light hand with this, but, um, but at times it becomes apparent that they have to step that up. Our bottom line has to be something simple, and I call it discoveries. It's basically we need to improve the quantity and quality and the relevance of the information obtained and viewed by our users, and we need to be able, wherever possible, see that by studying our web logs. So we can design sites in the beginning with interviews. We can go back and ask users questions. But in the end, we have to really make sure that we delivered and we see a change, a quantitative change, in how people are using our system. So we do want to interview users, but we focus also on iterating, uh, constantly developing a, a, a quantitative picture of how people are using our site, and then modify what we're doing, and then seeing if, if that's working better. All right. Now, it turns out that it is not easy to do this. It's not intuitive. And we're still struggling with it. But we can make, we, we've made quantitative, easy to prove examples of this. And sometimes our users are not even aware when we've made a change in the system, and we can see that, that a certain fraction of the users are doing better with it. In many ways, the, although open access is a positive and so forth, I think the returns on, on the investment with all the IT and so forth have not been as dramatic as we'd like for academic communication, for communicating scientific knowledge. Certainly in terms of the cost, journals are more and more expensive, textbooks are more and more expensive. Still, much of the content is not as broadly available as you'd like. Just think of the small biotech companies around this country. They can't get at almost any of the content. It's way too expensive for them uh, to, uh, uh, to get subscriptions to everything. Um, the other problem that I think is even more important is that it takes so long to publish a paper, even in an open access journal, even in PLOS One. So it would be great if we had an approach that we could have almost something like a blog. Anybody can be an author. We can get feedback from readers and reviewers, but we had peer review as well. So actually, there is an option for that right now that we've been playing around with. We've been using the Google uh, Now authoring system. Uh, because of the pandemic uh, in spring, uh, I contacted the folks at PLOS and at Google and suggested that we try to do a new kind of journal that would be very rapid turnaround that would do screening to make sure by experts in the field that the content was fine, that the experimental me methods were solid and so forth, but would be fast. And essentially what, what we do is we use something, uh, the null system, where you author on the server, you actually compose the paper on the server, your profile, your Google profile contains all of your affiliation and other metadata, you invite your co-authors, their metadata and so forth is connected to the paper, and you just press a button to submit it. Everything is there, all the figures. And if it's accepted, uh, it gets, gets peer reviewed. If it's accepted, you press a button, it's immediately available. And the next day, uh, PubMed Central gets the XML content because Google has worked uh, with us to have uh, uh, an output of the system that's already structured.